Hi there, this is our European News Weekly. It's just a short uh, podcast uh, just to talk, discuss the issue with uh, the Paris terrorist that was uh, blown up, specifically the female one. Um, and uh, we've now got information that she's, uh, she, she didn't actually wear a vest, but she was in a flat, I believe, with her, uh, what is her, her uh, presumed cousin who uh, masterminded the attacks and uh, I suppose him or uh, another colleague had uh, basically set off the bomb. Uh, but uh, we wanted to talk, you know, obviously the, the whole story is being covered uh, ad infinitum on the internet, um, but we just wanted to zoom in on, on her uh, and uh, try and look at well, why did uh, Hasna at Bulachem, uh, who is 26, uh, basically uh, be involved with, uh, with the terrorists. Now, we do know that there may be uh, some familial uh, connections, so uh, we're basically uh, sort of saying maybe that was one thing that drew her in. Uh, we know she had uh, came from a good background, uh, we know that um, uh, obviously there is something that radicalised her, um, and uh, so what we have now is uh, we decided that we were going to sort of compare it. Uh, we were talking with our uh, our friend in uh, Tokyo, John Doe, and he was uh, very much in, interested in uh, sort of the Japanese uh, terrorist uh, in the seventies, Fuzako uh, Shingen Obi. And uh, she basically, um, uh, she, she also probably came from a quite a good background, and uh, uh, but something radicalised her. So uh, what I'll do is, if I was to bring us to John Doe, bring him into the conversation. Now we have Jimmy on the side, Jimmy Hagen on the side. He's got some questions and points to bring in, um, and I think you'll find it quite an interesting conversation. Uh, we have uh, an Irishman. Uh, and not two Irishmen indeed, uh, and uh, somebody from Japan talking about uh, terrorism, uh, and we're, we're connecting it with the Paris attacks. And in, 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 you know, why did uh, Hasna uh, get involved with all this this crowd, and uh, what made her um, sort of be in a, a flat with a with, with the terrorists that organised the event? So, um, John, just bringing you in now. Could, could you? I think a good good thing to do is obviously to start off with maybe if you could uh, tell us about Fusako, um, you know who, who was she um, and uh, where did she come from uh, and where did she go to <coughs> and um, uh, w- welcome John Doe uh, uh, fire away mate I'll, I'll leave the platform up to you for, for five minutes or so to uh, give us a little bit of history. Well, she's a very interesting case when you study the history of leftism and radicalism in Japan. Her, she, her father uh, was a teacher at uh, temple schools in Japan. Uh, it was open for poor village children in the Kyushu region after the First World War. He later went on to be a, um, a soldier in the Imperial Japanese Army and fought in Manchuria, which was under colonial rule by Japan during World War II. So by no means was she someone who was prone to the, the, the more extreme ills of society, she was a bit sheltered from all that. She got involved in radicalism during her time when she was a, a student at Meiji University. She was working on a BA in, in political economy and a BA in history. She got involved in the student movement there uh, due to the way that the, um, the university was treating students for as tuition fees and various other problems like that. And that got her into more activism and actually led to her getting the student leftist movement in the 60s. Interesting thing about her, though, she wasn't led by any, any uh, male or any, any man. She did this on her own. And she rose quickly rose up to the ranks and left this movement in Japan until she became one of like the top organizers and top leaders of the movement during that time. She eventually joined something called the Japanese Red Army. It's a very well-known radical leftist group. In Japan, everybody knows about the Japanese Red Army and what they did and the things they were involved in. And they did a lot of things in Japan. They were involved in a lot of uprising, a lot of movements that went on in leftism during that time. Because at that time in Japan, the leftist movement was very strong. They were fighting the government tooth and nail on various major issues that were affecting the future of Japan. And she eventually ended up in the Middle East. Uh, they were there to, um, she initially went over there to 
make more contacts and develop more camaraderie with um, different radical leftist groups over there. And eventually, what happened was there was a split between the Red Army faction due to like the difference of them being in the Middle East and the other groups being in Japan and some other differences with um, ideas. So she ended up staying in the Middle East for over 30 years, I believe. And she was involved in um, the popular front for the liberation of Palestine, heavily involved in that, and also uh, a lot of involvement in uh, Lebanon. So she was not in support of um, terrorist groups that carry out terror to enforce oppression upon other people. She wasn't like involved in these groups like ISIS or groups kind of like Al-Qaeda. These are more leftist groups that were seeking to get these Middle Eastern countries' sovereignty and to establish people's rule. They're heavily involved in things like Marxism and socialism. So she's a very different type of terrorist. And she was arrested eventually in Japan because she returned to Japan. They found her in a small village, <laughs> ironically enough, in Japan when she returned here, I guess to see family and things. And the funny story about how she was arrested was that she was actually posing as a man. She was dressed up as a man to hide her identity. You know, it gets better. The only reason they caught her is because of the way she smokes her cigarettes. She smokes cigarettes the same way you, you, you would um, hold a pipe. And that's how the cops got her. And she was sentenced uh, to 20 years in prison as of 2006 for um, using a fake passport, um, helping another member of the Japanese Red Army in a... Um, obtaining a, uh, a fake passport, passport, and for attempted manslaughter by planning and commanding the occupation and hostage taking at the French embassy in The Hague. And uh, that's what she's in jail for now. Now, she is in Japan in jail for a 20-year sentence. Uh, how much of that has she got left, by the way? Oh, well, it, um, she was sentenced in 2006, so now it's 2015, so she's pulled up. And what about remission, John? Is there, is there any such thing as remission uh, of sentence in uh, Japan? In Japan, if you do some, do the type of thing she did and achieve the type of thing she did, the Japanese government really doesn't have any um, leniency for you. They, there's a thing in Japan that they, typically, they, they extremely hate uh, leftist radicals. There's, there's other cases I know of uh, leftists who are currently in jail in Japan for political activity. Right. And, uh, you did make a really good point there. You were saying that she kind of uh, fought oppression because obviously Japan's quite a, you know, obviously the left were fighting an incredibly right-wing misogynist government. So basically she was fighting oppression, but she was, uh, whereas like you made a, the distinction that ISIS were actually trying to, you know, uh, uh, put, put oppression in, bring oppression into the factor. There just seem to be two different uh, mindsets. So, uh, I thought that was, I just thought that was a good point. I thought that was worth highlighting. Um, we, we were talking also uh, before the show, uh, and it really was to do with the uh, an article in Irish Central. Um, in 2011, uh, run, uh, wrote by Kathy Hayes. Um, and it was entitled, uh, Females in the IRA Explodes, uh, Explodes Idea of Women as Pawns in Terrorism. Um, so we were looking at, and you were saying she was very much uh, uh, a sort of upfront person. You know, she, was, she had her own place. Now, I don't know if, um, if, if basically if... Uh, it, What's the name if uh, the the Paris female attacker terrorist? You know if she she got into it for that reason. But um, I, I was just going to read a little bit of this uh, this article uh, because I thought it quite interesting. Um, so they were, they, were, they were discussing uh, with um, uh, Bloom, who's a fellow at the International Centre for the Study of Terrorism. Um, she was looking at uh, uh, female participation in the world's most recognised terrorist groups uh, in her book. And she explained that there are five reasons for why females get involved in terrorism. She says it's revenge, redemption, relationship, 
respect and rape. Um, now, probably, you know, obviously this is a very well uh, sort of uh, uh, researched person uh, who's looked into it. Uh, it's probably quite a simplification, but uh, where would you say that Fusaka came in in terms of re revenge, redemption? Would it be redemption, would it? Is that her reason? If you put it in that, that context, yeah, I would say she was probably, in those limited contexts there, I would say she was probably most motivated by redemption. Right. More than, like, revenge, and there wasn't any sexual abuse going on. And yeah. it, there was no real personal romantic relationships that initially got her involved. Sure. So most likely part of redemption. Okay, that's right. Really interesting. And then um, I'll sort of go on the... Uh, uh, leaders of terrorist groups uh, encourage female participation in their organisation, which is coming on to your, your point about the men being in charge, uh, for several reasons. Women are more often effective at attracting media attention. Uh, they're also held up as an example to goad males into joining with or increasing their participation in terrorist movements. And, and with that point, do you think the Red Army uh, allowed the rise of Fusako, uh, Fusako you know, for the, the kind of PR reasons uh, that I've just outlined? Well, in the case of the Red Army, they were a very different type of group. And how Fasako got into the leftist movement was a bit different. She came in on her own terms. And she was fighting things that she see material were wrong. So, you know, she wasn't really used as a media recruitment tool by, by the Red Army. Because she was one of the founding members of it. But she was one of the leaders of it. So she was never used that way. And I think the Red Army would have took it exception to anyone from the group suggesting she, she should be used as some type of media pawn. And she would often take the lead with talking to the press. She would, you know, she would do these things, but as far as anything documented, the Red Army actually using her to promote you know, the cause, hey, you guys should join because look what this woman is doing. Not really went on a lot with that. Sure. And, uh, I mean, I'll come to the last little bit of this article that I was going to pick out. And uh, the quote from it is, uh, it, however, in some other terrorist groups, women do hold a lower status, and I'll use this cannon for the fodder. Uh, the truly deplorable thing about female suicide bombing is that in many cases, women are usually selected to attack civil right, uh, civil civilian targets or soft targets, says Bloom. So women are being used to kill other women and children. Um, so... I, th I think at the end of the day, it's uh, that, that kind of point, it does highlight what you're saying about Fusako being a, a kind of a different type kind, you know, a, a sort of an idealist-led um, uh, sort of uh, person. And uh, I think mm. redemption probably is, is the redemption of human beings, you know, so that we could have a better, a better life, I think. Is it, is it, is it, would that be a fair comment? Something? Yeah, yeah, you know, Fusako was a very different type of, "Quote unquote terrorist." Sure. And the she, fact she, that she wasn't. Sorry, I was going to say she did. Uh, she was involved in an operation at Lodad Airport where 27 people were killed. Was that was that the first time that she really killed? She did a lot of um, sort of hold holdups on uh, and uh, this, this sort of uh, hostage taking things. But I think that yeah, one, a lot uh, of that. There was 27 that. people killed. What, what happened things. there? Well, that case, I mean. I think it came down to something London, uh, England was doing to uh, Palestine and, and Lebanon, uh, involving their, their supporting of the oppression of those people there, uh, sending military operations in that area, you know, and I guess just the frustration of that came to a point where it was time to send a message back to the government of, of the UK to say that, you know, if you're going to come over here, and, and abuse these people and, and you know, and, and oppress them or be prepared for a taste of your own medicine. You know, I think that's probably what motivated that the most. OK, so, I mean, I mean, so b bottom line was it was they were getting more desperate in, in, in terms of, would that be a fair comment? Um, yeah, it was frustration because, you know, these, the Red Army was very political. Sure. You know, they would contact lots of people and try to negotiate things. Because they, they, would, they would use peaceful methods and also would use more violent methods. 
like a combination because they were I- ideological. Right. But so there was there was a point where they would uh, where they would discuss uh, they would uh, uh, discuss terms with authorities. Yeah, you know, man, those terms were always pretty clear. It's like you know, you get out of here, you leave these people alone, you have sovereignty, you know. But we want to talk about it, talk about how you're going to leave, you know. But we want you out of here, <laughs> you know. We want you gone. Yeah. Right. But they they were political in the fact that they would negotiate and they would talk. But, you know, these governments, because they were a leftist organization, a radical leftist organization, all these governments were like, we're not going to talk to you, screw you. Whatever you say, we don't care. And I guess it got to the point where I just got tired of hearing that. And it's like, okay, you, you want to fight dirty and try to come over here and murder and slaughter people all the time. Well, if that's how you want things, okay. <laughs> you know? Of course, here, here in Ireland, uh, we have a, uh, there's quite a few females still locked up, I believe, uh, for various IRA uh, uh, or uh, provisional IRA or uh, continuity IRA sort of offences. Um, but I was going to say, Jimmy, what, what, what's your take on this? Uh, you know, obviously you're, you're up by the border there. <laughs> well, one thing that just springs to mind here is that uh, one man's or woman's um, terrorist is a, a, another man or woman's freedom fighter, you know? And um, how are we going to... V- how do we differentiate, I guess, in a way, between the, the so-called terrorists who are the freedom fighters of our day and uh, as opposed to the terrorists like um, say the larger corporate governments on uh, in general like say the, the US and Russia and like France the colonial powers you know um, I think it's a question of semantics like uh, is it not all a form of terrorism in its own way whether you're a freedom fighter or whether you're a soldier fighting the, 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 the good cause you know well, I suppose it depends on the Environment. I mean, we have a situation now in Ireland, stunningly enough, where where foreign uh, uh, special services can be brought into Ireland if there was a, a terrorist attack, um, and that would mean that we'd have the SAS coming over to Ireland to uh, to uh, sort out the paddies. But, but um, Sean, there, there is no could in that matter. They're already here. They have been here since two thousand and nine. So we we'll, we we can safely put that to bed. They've never left the country. So. In a well, sense. I think this is just a tactic uh, admission and uh, confirmation that they're allowed to come here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, it, it, but you know, that situation uh, on top of the Good Friday Agreement in Ireland, you know, I think is going to, you know, that, that's just a, 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 a sort of a, a not a good idea uh, in Ireland, particularly. Mm. I think. Um, so, you know, we, we can see how, how certainly, you know, if I can think that, um, and I'm very moderate. Um, I, I would say that uh, it would be very amazing to see, you know, how people who are a little bit more nationalistic might take that particular sort of uh, um, sort of concession by the Irish government to uh, to the European sort of war machine, if you like, the NATO-led war machine. But uh, so, I mean, it, it's quite interesting. We're, we're getting much more. Uh, much more violent uh, sort of world now, and it's very much like it was in the seventies, uh, John. What do you? Yeah, what's, your, what's your take on the situation and where where we're going? You know, with female radicalization in in Japan because Japan's very radical at the moment, and in various other countries. Yeah, I mean, the world is coming similar things, similar situation from the sixties and seventies, but the context is much different now because we have global capitalism in the world. You know, and now the the increase in violence in the world is really, I think, a result of how imperialism has really gotten rather extreme in the world. You know, you, it's, it's related, to relate it to the current uh, activities here in Japan with leftism, it's coming down to the Japanese government basically, you know, bending over backwards to serve the interest of, of America. And we have a rather right-wing fascist government at the moment. And it's a lot of anti-war, a lot of anti-nuclear, a lot of things about the economy are being brought up by the, by the leftists over here now. And I think that's a, um, a reoccurring theme among many situations in the world right now where things are getting more violent and more radical is that people are really getting tired of this imperialism and this global capitalism that's going on. And it's always a reoccurring theme. It's, you know, anti-war or something about the environment, uh, something economic. Human rights. These themes reoccur, you know, and I think it affects women a lot. 
it draws women to that because those are things that affect women far more than, than it does men globally, you know. And things like, you know, economics and war, you know, women suffer a lot in those situations, you know. Sure, sure. Now, that's a very good point. So we could actually be looking at the radical, uh, radicalization of, uh, of more women um, in, in this sort of uh, decade, should we say. I would not be surprised by it, you know, because right now I look at some of the, the, the current leaders of different uh, left-wing organizations in Japan and different um, movements in Japan. There's a, a young woman up there almost every time, you know, speaking her mind and being a leader and organizing things. You know, sure. so I do see a lot more women in, in, involved in things. Right, and that's, that's in Japan where women are pretty much second-class citizens in terms of employment and what have you. Yeah, it's pretty extreme here. I mean, you would be, for a, for a first world industrialized nation like Japan, you'd be rather surprised to talk to a lot of women, ask about their work situation, how they're treated at work. I mean, you still have situations here in Japan where the women working at the office are expected to serve tea to the men. Yeah. And so, that, you know, that would be unheard of, you know, <laughs> and, you know in a lot of uh, first world industrialized nations, you know. So, so that kind of means that for Sako, then, uh, it's kind of like a warning uh, to to the government, you know, to engage in in uh, discussion with uh, with with the, uh, these large groups of people who are saying, you know, we have we have worries. Uh, at the moment, they seem to be just ignoring everyone. But uh, but but is there is there any pressures that are succeeding with all these mass demonstrations? You know, the peaceful demonstrations. What do you mean by pressure? Uh, well, I mean, I think the question would be really: um, Are people able to? You know, are they getting wins? I mean, I know that some of the uh, the nuclear plants in some areas are not opening because of local pressure. Um, I know there's a massive uh, mobilisation uh, to do with the Sarka. So, how, mm. how, how are, 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 is there successes? Basically, are there successes from this? I tell you. Uh, the to be honest, the groups that are having the most success with various things that leftism in Japan is going up against is these groups that take more direct action. And that doesn't always mean uh, your cl the classical idea of carrying out violence. No, uh, I've been involved in a few groups that would take things like, um, like racism, for example, in, in Japan. I'll give you an example of this, something I've been involved in a bit. What happens is these groups um, physically block and obstruct the carrying out of, of racism or the carrying out of groups supporting racism. They will physically block them and say, no, you're not going to do this. You know? And that's when they, they do get some success. Uh, as far as the protest movement here, it's not completely unified on the left. So they make a lot of noise. And they, they, get, they get, in, get into it with the police, and a lot of things go on. But for our successes, it, it's building. It's like a boiling pot here in Japan. And they're able to stop things, they delay things at times. So their, their success is coming when they, they directly try to block and stop things, and when they uh, delay things from happening. You know. But it's still a boiling pot here so far. And uh, looking at the 70s when Japan had a rising left and they were asking for human rights and equality and uh, keeping the corporations in check, um, can, can you see, uh, was it, did it seem like there was more success then? They certainly seem to have uh, affected the government quite a lot, you know, the, the left-wing uh, lobby. Um, uh, are they having the same effect now? And what's stopping them uh, having the same effect now? Or of course, you know, the left was far stronger in the 60s and 70s, and they had a far more greater effect on the Japanese government. Today, because um, it's a rebirth here in Japan of, of leftism and of, you know, of taking direct action and saying, no, we don't want this system, we don't want this way of living. Um, so it's, and the thing that's holding them back is that there's kind of a split in leftism in Japan, and there's the old old guard left here in Japan that is that still sticks to a lot of the ideas that they had in the 60s and 70s. 
uh, the methods of doing things and their ideology. And there's this other side, this newer left has come out in Japan. And they, they're new to it and they don't have a lot of experience, but they're trying. And so until these two sides can work better together and more unify themselves together, it's going to be a consistent problem that comes up of leftism in Japan. Or they hold themselves back because, you know, the newer kids out there don't want to listen to the people who have been there and done it. So I think that's a lot what holds them back, and they, they want to go for a more um, liberal approach to it. You know, if we scream and shout and we protest enough, you know, the government's going to listen. Well, they have to learn that that doesn't always work. Right. So uh, that's some of the things that are holding them back now. Couldn't agree with you more, there, John. I think the, I think the jumping up and down and shouting and screaming and roaring uh, it doesn't really achieve a hell of a lot. But um, if we could kind of go back uh, a little bit, back to because um, we, we we kind of established now that the uh, women are sort of like kind of used in a sense uh, as pawns, maybe, uh, maybe not all the time, but uh, some of the time, and. Um, it seems to me that it's not just a that 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 just doesn't happen within terrorist organisations, but it also happens in the so-called good guys camps as well too, in terms of the the, the honey trap women that were used to to lure um, <coughs> terrorist leaders into into traps, say in previous years, and also like we're hearing reports uh, coming out lately, disturbing reports about how. Women um, who were being involved in protests uh, in England and various different places were used by policemen to gather intelligence and ended up getting pregnant by them. So um, I, th I think, uh, there, if, if, do you want to make a few comments on that point or those points? Yeah, you see, when you talk about oppression of women, it's all of society both sides you know the the radicals and the establishment it goes on you know because but the media always wants to focus on these radical evil terrorist organizations look at how they treat women and what we don't and you don't hear them talking about is hey look at how the government and the established bourgeois treat women you know they they'll send they'll use women to go out and go after the people they don't like you know, because there's, there's this image of how women are expected to behave. Women are expected to be nice and quaint and listening and caring. And so the bourgeois use this forced standard upon women in order to take out and attack the groups that are against the establishment and the government. And it's really... A hard systemic problem, and it's not acceptable at all. But governments do this; they yeah, use that bourgeois yeah. standard, on, but but women and, and use it to go after their enemies. You know? Yeah, and uh, just on the ma on that sort of, if we're looking at life on a micro scale, a small scale, if we look at the macro scale with the uh, with the actual larger movements of uh, leftists, if you like, in Japan at the moment, trying to stop nuclear, stop uh, uh, militarization, and what have you. Um, the, these uh, these groups now. Do you think that, they're, that, that the governments have got better in managing them in terms of like they, uh, you know, sort of spamming their uh, their sort of social networks to disrupt uh, and confuse? Uh, which is obviously, what uh, oh, so yes. oh, yes. GCHQ. Oh, yes. They've gotten much better at it. Yeah, they're very much better. They've gotten much seen. better at because the sixties and seventies, they didn't know the, the government would got caught with pants down. And had to basically engage in actual class warfare with people. You know, they, they would, um, in the 60s and 70s, they would do things like Sin Chimpita, which is low level kind of organized crime groups. They're, they're not really mafia. They're kind of, they would go into these protest groups and start knocking heads, you know, elbowing people, pushing people around, and spark a fight. And when that fight broke, out, you know, the, the police would come in, crack down, crack heads, and arrest people, and say, oh, look at these violent protesters. Now the Japanese government knows better, because that backfired on them. They started doing stuff like that. It only made the movement grow bigger. So these days what they do is they use police pressure to limit where you can go, what you can protest, 
where you can protest, how you can protest, uh, how you get access to the government. Because it's very hard for the average person to have any access to the government. You know, they're very, they're not transparent. You know, you go down to Kasumi Naseki, the central uh, government area of Tokyo, and all the government buildings are walled off and several hundred, hundred feet away from the wall of the actual building. Yeah, so now they protect themselves much more, and they use a lot of like uh, regulations and police tactics that limit what people can do, yeah. and so it, it damages the the leftist ability to to um, gather large movements up. Because you know in Japan, a lot of people if they can't see it, they won't want to join things. They they try to keep it small and marginalized as best they can. Yeah. But they didn't do in the 60s and 70s. They just come out and try to kill everybody. <laughs> you know, they just beat the hell out of everybody and make them go home. Yeah, now yeah. they use these other methods now. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. We see that in Europe. Uh, we're seeing it in the UK. It's getting much worse in the UK and very blatant. It's very worrying. You know, I know a lot of people are pushing back at it, but but mm. uh, but the, the, the pressure is there to become a, a kind of a 1984 George Orwell state. Um, uh, it's, it's already there, really, but... Uh, um, we certainly uh, the UCPI, which is to do with the undercover police operations uh, that included making women pregnant and just dumping them and walking, you know, for a, after a few years, just walking away. <clears throat> One of the actual police there, he actually got a position in a in a university teaching, uh, you know, sort of uh, police tactics, uh, undercover tactics. Um, so, uh, but there's a big uh, pushback against that with the UCPI, uh, which is the undercover police Pickford inquiry. And uh, and then basically, which are, you know, in fact, I'm actually going to be submitting to because it's, things happen to me, um, and I know one other person is uh, also considering uh, submitting to it as well from the anti-nuclear sort of uh, activist uh, crowd. Um, so we are seeing that, and uh, it has to be said, it does radicalise you much more when they start using all this technology against you. You know, you, you're uh, you're a rat in a the corner. There's nothing you can do. You know, you're you're blacklisted for life. So that's that. Um, it certainly seems, uh, you know, you have to be a strong man sometimes to the two or a woman um, to uh, be able to take the step down the, the, the path of uh, calling for truth, you know. So uh, anyway, is, is there anything you'd like to say, Jimmy, in terms of finishing up or any questions or that you anything you'd like to know uh, that, uh, about Fusako, the Japanese uh, terrorist um well i actually watched that little video that was posted the other night I, I think you sent it over to me that was a that was a fascinating little uh, watch that it was very very interesting to see such an old video as well too from the 70s and uh, food for thought you know a very very strong looking woman very very calm very very collected and uh, very very well spoken and very very well educated and uh, and and it seemed to me that she was more of a peace advocate rather than a terrorist. But you know, this is the nature of, of, of this is the nature of war, I guess. And some, I suppose when you get people pushed to the edge and and they they, they feel they have uh, nothing left to lose anymore, and they they, they take up arms against uh, against a monster. And this is the this is the nature of life, I guess. You know, it's a. Sure. You know, uh, well, the monster is well armed this time oh round. Oh God, as we can yeah, see in yeah, Syria. yeah. We're we're like the Palestinians throwing stones at the at the bombers. Exactly. Yeah. No, this is a good point. And uh, I, I suppose uh, is there is there any last thoughts you've got? To, you know, on this sort of little discussion before we we uh, close it down and pop it up onto the web, um, John. You know, so what, what would you say is? Uh, now, what would you say is the, the lesson of Fusako? Is there a lesson of Fusako? There is one, definitely. I think the thing she's accomplished and what the Red Army did, to put it into a modern context, it's proof that when you look at, quote-unquote, terrorist groups, not all these groups are looking to just destroy society and put in an um, oppressive rule and replace one horrible thing of another. There are groups who, yes, sometimes do carry out violence. We have to look at what they, why they do it for. What's their reason for doing these things? And look at, you know, Fasako, yeah, she was very much into wanting peace and sovereignty for people. But there were times when it was time to get a bit more aggressive. It was time to take actions that label someone a terrorist. 
But it's always important to remember why these groups are doing things and to, and to understand who they really are. And I think Fasaco is proof that, you know, you can do these things for the, the cause of actually improving people's lives and benefiting the masses. So I think that's where, what we can take from her. Okay, well, that's a really, really sort of uh, um, uh, amazing sort of uh, sort of ju- uh, sort of uh, look at life, and I think I think, but but without a doubt, you are right because you know there is the the aspect of um, you know when you're not being listened to, how do you get your point across? Um, I think you know in Northern Ireland, you know uh, there were other pressures, no doubt, but uh, certainly the discussion. Uh, that was going on between the Catholic and Protestant sides. Uh, there were certainly uh, many, you know, many people involved on grassroots level to break down the uh, prejudices. Um, and, uh, and then on top of that, we had the Good Friday Agreement, uh, which was an arrangement to draw a line, more or less, uh, under what happened and to go forward. Um, and what we see in Northern Ireland, you know, which is worrying for me, and we brought it up in our previous podcast, is that they didn't use the, the money in the places in Northern Ireland that needed the money. Uh, they just seemed to, maybe Belfast got a little bit richer for a while, but not all parts of Belfast. So some estates, have, people have no jobs. Uh, it's, it's just a very bad situation. Um, and that's to do with the way the governments um, have and the people in charge have, have uh, shared the money around in Northern Ireland that was made available. But anyway, well, uh, hopefully we'll um, discussions like this, you know, or difficult maybe, um, uh, need to happen. And I hope uh, other people uh, will think about, you know, what we're talking about here, uh, because uh, it really does affect everybody around the world. Um, you know, where there's an oppression, um, where people aren't being listened to, um, you know, we find frustration and, uh, and radicalization. So... You know, um, I think I'd, I'd, I'd finish on, on that note. How about you, Jimmy? You, you, do you want to finish on anything? Any thoughts? Well, yeah, it's quite interesting what you're saying there about how um, in, the, in the modern world that we're living in, we can end up like we're getting radicalised as such. But I think at the same time, it's more important, more than ever, that we try and find more peaceful ways of dealing with the situation and... Um, my uh, my my wish would be that instead of bearing arms, people just stop paying taxes and stop uh, consenting to the system. But uh, that's probably just a pipe dream. But uh, I'm going. <laughs> that's what I dream about. Our sovereign warrior finishes <laughs> on a, on a on a on a positive note. Well, this is it's a sovereign station, so we've got sovereign ideas, and we we kind of try and stick to the peaceful if we can, and try and avoid radicalisation at all. And uh, accept and recognise everybody else's sovereignty as much as our own. So um, I'll, I'll, that, I'll leave it at so, that. All right. So it's peaceful change and make people aware of their rights. This is it. Okay. Look, John. Thank you so much for coming in on this. It's uh, you know, I was quite fascinated with Fasalco, and I'm, I'm really pleased that you've come in and you've given a sort of kind of a, uh, a sort of a, a good little bit of uh, information about her and about Japan in general and about, the, and, you know, how, how uh, things are in Japan at the moment. Thank you so much for that. Um, thanks, Jimmy. It was my so, pleasure. I really um, appreciate being on the show again. Yeah, uh, totally. It was and, great uh, having Jimmy, you back, John. That was, that was a good point that you brought in there, good points. And, uh, you know, we, we had to sort of uh, look, at, look at the world from one side of it to the other, from Japan to Ireland and all the bits in between. Um, and uh, just hope that uh, peace, uh, discussion, and uh, and uh, common sense. Uh, common sense. You, st- you you stole the word right out of my mouth there, John. Common sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, totally. Thanks very much, John. That was a pleasure.